All right, welcome to uh, uh, Cannabis in Medicine, Practical Guidelines for the Practitioner. And I'm really excited because I have the honor of introducing our speaker who is well known to many. Uh, Dr. Fry obviously is the chair of the MedKai Cannabis Committee. Um, uh, Dr. Fry is a integrative physician experienced in the use of cannabis and cannabinoids in the medical management of chronic and treatment of resistant condition in both children and adults. Uh, professionally, she was certified by the University of Vermont School of Medicine in Cannabis Science and Medicine. Dr. Fry serves on the board of the Society of Cannabis Clinicians as chair of the Committee on Education on the Maryland MedKai Medical Society's Cannabis Task Force. She is an affiliate associate professor in medical cannabis science and therapeutics at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy, where her book, The Medical Marijuana Guide, Cannabis and Your Health, is an official reference. Dr. Fry lectures internationally on the science and medical use of cannabis and serves on the U.S. Cannabis Council's Task Force on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. She has testified on several panels addressing cannabis legislation, regulation, and social justice issues at state hearings and on Capitol Hill. And, and let me say this, um, you know, I've gotten to have the pleasure of getting to know her and work with her over the last few years. And she really uh, focuses on the science of this. And I've met other practitioners who don't. <laughs> so I, it's just, I can't tell you how wonderful it is to have her chairing our committee and working with us so we can really get good answers and try to, try to, uh, try to move forward and be uh, progressive and a, and a source for science on this. Uh, this is accredited for CME, and Frank Berry, the CME director, or Barbara uh, Fitzgerald, who's also on the call, uh, are going to put the link up in the chat a few times. So please fill the chat, uh, the the form out from the chat. It's a quick electronic form, and you'll get one credit of CME for it. Uh, and having said that, I will stop talking now and turn it over to our speaker, uh, Dr. Fry. Thank you, Dr. Fry. Thank you, Jane. Okay. Um, first, I'd like to start with saying that my slides sometimes jump ahead by themselves, so um, bear with me. Um, I have really no financial uh, conflicts of interest, interest to disclose, uh, other than I am a recommender, and I see patients um, for uh, use of cannabis. Um, I'd like to, um, to achieve these objectives of having all of you have knowledge of the endocannabinoid system and its interaction with the plant, um, understand the biological actions of the major cannabinoids, uh, to have knowledge of the onset and duration of action of various modes of delivery, uh, to be knowledgeable about the medical conditions that commonly respond to cannabinoids, um, the possible adverse effects of cannabis and cannabinoids, and um, um, what special considerations to take um, for pediatric, geriatric, and pregnant populations. So I'm going to take a little bit of time to talk a little bit about the history of cannabis as medicine. I think it's important for everyone to understand our relationship with this plant. Um, we as humans have had a relationship with the plant for over 5,000 years. It's mentioned in the Chinese Pharmacopoeia, which was written in 2700 BC. It was used as a treatment for pain. It's referenced in Egyptian papyri dating back to 1400 BC as a treatment for menstrual cramps and depression. In Exodus 30:23, which was written in the 5th or 6th century BC, cannabis is referenced when God directed Moses on how to make a holy anointing oil composed of myrrh, sweet cinnamon, cannabosem, which is Hebrew for cannabis, cassia, and olive oil. And Hu To, a Chinese surgeon who lived in about 140 to 280 AD, uh, used cannabis, moonflower, and wine to anesthetize patients for successful abdominal surgery. He was actually able to resect bowel and reanastomosis, and patients lived through it and woke up several days later. The Chinese word for anesthesia literally translates to cannabis intoxication, and cannabis is an integral part of Ayurveda, which is a very traditional medicine of India, and it was used in ancient Islamic medicine and referenced by the philosopher Avicenna, who wrote the Canon of Medicine, which was the premier go-to medical reference for all of Europe until well into the uh, mid 11th century. And it was introduced to Western medicine in the early 1800s by an Irish surgeon by the name of William O'Shaughnessy, who learned of its use in treating tetanus and seizures in India 
during his service with the British East India Company, where he studied toxins and developed the first rehydration solution for patients with cholera. And he wrote a beautiful um, case study of infantile spasms that you can find online. It was written, I believe, in 1835. And it's a classic example of how to use cannabis, how to start with small doses, titrate. It's really a, a well-written case study and well, well worth the time to read it. Um, cannabis was introduced to the U.S. Pharmacopoeia in 1857 and was used to treat a number of conditions, including irritable bowel syndrome, menstrual cramps, migraines, seizures, croup, depression, and insomnia. So in addition to being a prescription medicine, cannabis was used by a small segment of the population, mainly African Americans and Mexican Americans who had rather limited access to medical care, and they smoked the flower or they made green tincture to treat things like chronic pain, arthritis, anxiety, and stress. Then in 1932, when Harry J. Aslinger was um, head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics and was facing the repeal of alcohol prohibition, it's thought that this was what prompted um, the, the campaign against um, cannabis. He needed a target to go after, and this was an easy target because the people who were using it outside of the um, medical care uh, realm were mainly minorities with very little um, political um, or economic clout. And when he was telling these, these stories to the Ways and Means Committee about this um, substance that was causing these hideous side effects, like people were murdering their parents and just crazy whatnots, it was the legislative council from the American Medical Association, a Dr. William Woodward, who was Georgetown trained um, in medicine, also graduated from Georgetown Law School, and he testified to the committee that while they were ha that the medical community was having some dosing issues with cannabis and it wasn't being used as much since the advent of tablets like uh, aspirin and morphine that he had really never heard of these um, crazy side effects and that it was um, even unknown to the medical community that this was on the table to be banned and that while it wasn't being used as often, there were certain conditions for which they had no real good alternatives, and that if they um, did this, that it would interfere with or stop any further research into the plant where we could really learn how to maximize its benefits. And, and certainly that's what happened. And he also pointed out that because they were using this word marijuana, which was some kind of Aztec word that meant something like old tobacco or bad tobacco, that the physicians weren't even aware because the name of the plant was the cannabis sativa L and that it would um, be uh, uh, unlikely that most of the medical community would understand what this what they were talking about with this marijuana. So that in 1942, the, medical, the Marijuana Tax Act was passed and made it so expensive that pharmaceutical companies like Park Davis and Eli Lilly Merck no longer found it profitable, and so they stopped producing the capsules and tinctures. And in 1970, the final nail in the coffin was when Nixon had cannabis added to the Controlled Substances Act as a Schedule One, despite really substantial evidence presented by the Schaefer Commission that the plant was not dangerous and, and it really should not be criminalized. Uh-oh, there go those slides. So while the, the identification of THC and then CBD occurred in the early 1940s by Roger Adams and his team at the University of Illinois, it wasn't until 1964 when Raphael Meshulam, an Israeli chemist um, at the Hebrew University, um, was able to describe the chemical makeup of these molecules. And it wasn't until 1988 when Drs. Elaine Howlett and the late William Devane, while at St. Louis University, discovered the CB1 receptor. And this led to the uncovering of a master neuromodulating system that was named the endocannabinoid system. And further research found that the system regulates almost every other neurotransmitter system as well as the immune system and that the sole purpose is, seems to be to keep the body in homeostasis. 
So this is a very old system. It's thought to be somewhere between 600 and 800,000 years old. It's present in every organism from jellyfish to humans, with the exception of insects, which and they seem to have a different signaling system for homeostasis. Um, it has more receptors than any other receptor system in the body. And as I said, the primary purpose seems to be to keep things in balance. So it regulates appetite, it regulates sleep, stress and anxiety, mood. It helps us to forget things that are unimportant or that are traumatic. It interrupts pain signaling. Once the brain has gotten the message that um, there's um, a problem, it, it actually turns the pain signal off. It, it actually rec uh, modulates muscle tone um, and sphincter tone and it is involved in not only fat and glucose, but also energy or calorie metabolism. So the system consists of um, G protein coupled receptors that are found on the cell membrane. And the CB1 receptors are widely expressed in the central nervous system, particularly in the forebrain um, and midbrain with a relative paucity of these receptors in the brain stem. The CB2 receptors are expressed mainly in the immune system, the GI tract, spleen, and liver. And they're found throughout the peripheral, mm, sorry, the peripheral um, nervous system. They um, also, um, the, the system also includes um, receptors such as the GPR15, GPR119, GPR18, um, TERP channels, serotonin uh, receptors, uh, PPAR gamma, GABA, glutamate, almost any neurotransmitter system, there's going to be some activity um, involved uh, with the endocannabinoid system. So these receptors are activated by ligands. The body makes um, probably several endocannabinoids. We um, have studied mostly anandamide, which is arachidonyl ethanolamide and 2 arachidonyl glycerol. These are referred to as anandamide or the bliss molecule or 2-AG. There are other uh, molecules that interact with, this, with these receptors such as PEA and beta-caryophyllin. Beta-caryophyllin is a um, terpene that's found throughout the spice world in black pepper, oregano, rosemary, um, and it is um, actually um, a, uh, a, an agonist at the CB2 receptor, one of the few compounds that we found or molecules that we found that, that actually directly interact with these cannabinoid receptors. So these ligands are, are not stored in vesicles like other neurotransmitters. They're made on demand. So when the body needs it, when something's out of balance, um, these, um, these uh, uh, neurotransmitters are synthesized from um, fatty acid precursors in the, in the synapse, on the postsynaptic cleft, and they go, they do their job, and then they are rapidly hydrolyzed, and the two of the main enzymes that hydrolyze these, these endocannabinoids are fatty acid amide hydrolase, which um, they refer to as FA, and monoarachoglycerol lipase, which is called MAGL, FA, typically um, hydrolyzes anandamide. Magal is the hydrolyzing enzyme for uh, 2-AG. This is a schematic of the, uh, the cross-section of the brain, looking at the, um, the forebrain and the midbrain, where we see that there's um, quite a, a high density of cannabinoid receptors in these areas of the brain, but in the brain stem, in the areas of cardiovascular and respiratory function or regulation, uh, while there's a high density of opioid, new opioid receptors, as indicated by the diamonds, there's a relative paucity of cannabinoid receptors in this area, and that's why um, the uh, plant has a very high LD50. No one will stop breathing um, from cannabis. And here we have a cross-section of... Uh-oh. Okay. So... Um, as I said, unlike other neurotransmitters, that they're, um, they're, they're not stored in vesicles. They're made um, on demand. And what we have here is an action potential. This is a, this is a, um, 
a uh, pain nerve in the dorsal horn, or you have an action potential, there's a problem. Um, it uh, stimulates the release of calcium ion, which crosses the, um, the cleft. And here in the postsynaptic cleft, um, the, the endocannabinoids are, are um, produced, and then they travel retrograde uh, to the CB1 receptor on the presynaptic cleft, and that um, turns off the calcium ion channels. It actually um, turns off glutamate um, uh, production as well. And so this is how um, the, the cannabinoids, um, particularly C, uh, THC, which interacts with the CB1 receptor, can, um, can act as an analgesic. Um, once they have uh, done their job, again, they're hydrolyzed by FA or MAGL, and man, these slides. And so these, um, these cannabinoids that are, um, these receptors that are involved in pain, such as vanilloid, um, the um, uh, PPAR, GPR55, and GPR119, um, also interact with, with these um, cannabinoids, at least with THC at the CB1 receptor in a very similar manner. So the conditions for which um, patients commonly seek cannabis um, certifications uh, tend to be, number one is high pain. This has been consistent from the early, from the early 2000s, probably late 1990s, when cannabis was um, legalized for medical use in California. And it, it, appears, to be, it appears to be effective in, in, in alleviating pain that's inflammatory in nature, neuropathic, um, it, can, it can be very helpful in, in a, either alleviating or preventing um, migraines with, mig with migraineurs. It can decrease the frequency of migraines, the, and when they do get a headache, it can definitely take down the severity and shorten the duration of the headaches. Um, it can be very helpful in some of these treatment resistant or, or difficult to treat syndromes like complex regional pain or amplified uh, musculoskeletal pain syndromes that are seen sometimes in, in children. Um, it has um, been used uh, really for, for millennia on mood issues like anxiety. Um, it can, uh, it actually, anandamide is a neurotransmitter that keeps the amygdala in an inhibited state. Um, and then when, when the organism is, or a person is stressed or is anxious because supposedly because of something that's threatening, um, that FA enzyme increases activity, um, hydrolyzes more anandamide so that the amygdala can go into a, a, a stress or an anxious state. But once that, um, once that event is over, then the FA enzyme activity is supposed to go down so that the anandamide can can increase in its activity and put it back in an inhibited state, much like a giraffe after the lion catches another giraffe or gives up, they go right back into a relaxed state. Um, they don't stay in this chronic anxious um, state that, that humans tend to do. And the same with chronic stress syndromes, um, the, the, especially CBD can get in there and interrupt that um, that hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis mechanism so that the cortisol levels can go down. And actually, with too much cannabis use and too little cortisol, that can be a problem for some people. So it definitely has its advantages and, and effective efficacy in treating um, stress um, and can be helpful in things like um, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, cannabinoids can help with depression. THC tends to be more of a mood elevator than, than CBD, but CBD does have some antidepressant activity, although you have to be careful with high um, doses of CBD because some, for some patients, they can report that their depression um, is worse. And, um, and it has a lot to do with serotonin receptors because um, CBD actually can um, modulate some of the uh, regulatory um, serotonin receptors. So using a combination of CBD and THC can be very helpful for patients with depression. Um, both CBD and THC are um, uh, effective in seizure disorders. We have the epidiolic studies that have really kind of put CBD on the map. 
THC can um, help with Tourette's. Um, so a lot of these, oh, and Parkinson's, I did, oh, Parkinson's I mentioned, neurodegenerative, but autism, the irritability and impulsivity, um, the aggressive behavior, the self-injurious behavior associated with autism um, is very difficult to feed. And the efficacy of a atypical antipsychotics is really kind of eh, plus minus. I think it was only a 20% efficacy over placebo in the studies that the FDA used to um, approve antipsychotics for treatment in autism. Um, they often don't work and they have a lot of side effects. Parents will come to you looking for help for these kids and young adults. Insomnia is a big one. The endocannabinoid system, as I said, regulates sleep patterns and cannabinoids can actually help patients achieve um, um, a, a shortened sleep latency as well as stay staying asleep and in a deeper level, more restorative level of sleep. Um, the neurodegenerative illnesses, uh, conditions uh, that cause chronic pain, muscle spasm, dementia, and tremor. Um, while cannabis is not a cure-all, it can definitely help um, by reducing pain. Um, most of these cannabinoids are muscle relaxants, so they can help with spasticity. Uh, dementia is not necessarily improved with cannabis, although some of these cannabinoids can improve focus, but um, the, the thought is that the may, they may actually um, help to slow down the progression of some of these um, illnesses like Alzheimer's, where THC actually interferes with the deposition of the amyloid plaques, which are one of the hallmarks of the illness. Um, and THC in particular tends to be helpful in the tremor um, associated with Parkinson's. Um, there are a number of gastrointestinal conditions that tend to respond to cannabis. Um, irritable bowel is one. Uh, Crohn's ulcerative colitis, um, and these are inflammatory. There's actually recent, um, uh, there's a recent paper looking at irritable bowel, which was in the past not considered to be an inflammatory um, condition and it's not the inflammation to the level that you see with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, but there's been a recent study looking at abnormal inflammatory patterns in patients with irritable bowel, and that may be part of the reason why these patients respond to cannabis. Um, but also, in, in addition to being anti-inflammatory, um, CBD in particular, and to a certain extent probably THC or they, they modulate um, GI motility. <clears throat> so they can relieve constipation. And uh, it seems that when patients are constipated, the cannabinoids tend to rev up peristalsis, but when there's diarrhea, and we certainly see this inflammatory in inflammatory bowel patients, that the cannabinoids tend to slow down peristalsis and, and actually decrease the frequency of diarrhea. And certainly um, is a palliative treatment and an end of care end of life care, uh, cannabis can be very helpful in helping patients to reduce pain or even to be you know, pain free for some patients um, and still be present and alert and interacting with their family and not um, you know, sed um, under such sedation and discomfort from narcotics. So um, there are, these are very typical reasons why a patient might um, come to you um, asking about um, using cannabis, cannabis as an alternative to pharmaceuticals. Um, and with the inflammatory bowel patients, they are generally referred because of treatment resistance. They either are not responding to um, medication or they've had significant adverse effects from biologicals or from steroids, and so they're no longer an option. And, and uh, sometimes if you follow these patients out long enough, the studies, Israeli studies by NAFLI, um, don't show improvement in inflammation, but they only followed those, stud those patients for about six months. I've had patients who are referred who um, we followed out 18 months to two years, and while we get symptom relief rather quickly with cannabinoids, it doesn't necessarily mean that the inflammatory process has improved, but 18 months to two years out, a lot of these patients, well, I'm not gonna say a lot, but some of these patients um, actually um, have uh, normal colonoscopies, um, which is um, pretty exciting. So in, in my practice, um, it, it just reflects um, the, the 
um, the data that shows that most patients who are coming looking for cannabis therapy are um, um, pain patients. The next most common condition would be anxiety. And um, generally, anxiety and pain go hand in hand. So a lot of those anxiety and insomnia patients are also pain patients. Um, and then after that, insomnia. And the reason that these, um, these patients um, get better, especially the pain patients, is, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later, is that the cannabis not only can interrupt that pain signal and act as an anti-inflammatory, but it also addresses mood disorders, which tend to enhance the release of pro-inflammatory mediators, mainly anxiety and depression. So if we don't get up under the anxiety and depression, it's very difficult to get up under the pain, especially chronic pain. And with pain, I want to say also that um, as of late, patients are starting to ask for certifications in preparation for surgery. And there are many patients who are now using cannabis post-operatively, um, and um, they report that the, the post-operative use of opioids is decreased significantly that they you know, may use you know, a, you know, an opioid for maybe two or three doses after a surgery. And this is including um, surgeries that produce a lot of pain. So um, I think it's time to start thinking about cannabis as a, as a plausible alternative for even acute pain and post-operative pain. So this is to reiterate the, um, the, the other medical benefits of cannabinoids that most other medications don't have. And in 1999, um, uh, researchers from NIH and UC Irvine um, submitted an application to the Department of Health or to the Patent Office um, to patent cannabinoids as antioxidants and neuroprotectants. And the patent was granted in 2003, so we all as U.S. citizens have a piece of the patent um, for cannabinoids um, under the Department of Health and Human Services. And, and that's how long we've known that these cannabinoids are beneficial medically. Also in 2017, most of you may be familiar with this already, but the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine um, did a, a huge meta-analysis of, um, of all of the studies, all the research papers that are out there on cannabis. and. Um, and they came to um, the conclusion that there was substantial evidence that cannabis is um, effective in, in, reduce, in treating chronic pain, that it's effective as an anti-emetic for patients. These were done in studies for patients who were on chemotherapy for um, uh, cancer, and that um, it was effective in reducing spasticity. Um, and this was looking at studies on patients with multiple sclerosis. Interestingly, that since the 1980s, dronabinol, which is the same THC molecule as in the plant, it doesn't have the same um, other compounds with it, so that does alter how, it, it is, how, it is, how effective it is, that it's FDA approved for treating nausea and vomiting uh, from chemotherapy, and it's FDA approved for treating spasticity associated with multiple sclerosis, but it's not FDA approved for treating chronic pain, so I, I wonder about that. That there was moderate evidence that it was effective in, in, in uh, um, helping short-term sleep outcomes in patients with sleep apnea, fibromyalgia, chronic pain, and multiple sclerosis. With sleep apnea, there are studies looking at the effect of THC on oropharyngeal tone, and they find that patients with um, sleep apnea using their CPAP once they start using THC to help with sleep, that the number of hypoxic episodes um, decrease. And the um, pain patients, which would be fibromyalgia and chronic pain, and certainly with multiple sclerosis with, with painful spasticity, there's probably sleep improvement due to the fact that they're more comfortable at night, um, as well as THC's effect on improving um, restorative sleep and CBD's effect on adenosine reuptake. Adenosine um, is um, kind of starts off kind of slow in the morning and gradually as the day wears on, it builds up, builds up to the evening. It's supposed to tell the, burn, the brain to start turning off some circuits and get ready for nighttime and sleep. 
But um, so with CBD, CBD actually interferes with the reuptake of adenosine, so it helps to bump up those adenosine levels, and that may be the mechanism by which high doses of CBD can be helpful for insomnia. And then they found some limited evidence that um, cannabis was um, um, effective in, in treating anxiety. The studies were really based on performance anxiety only, so it was limited evidence for improving uh, performance um, anxiety, uh, but it was um, also uh, the studies looking at PTSD were done on nabilone, which is a synthetic, and it really doesn't act the same way that um, THC does from the plant. So cannabis is part of the cannabaceae family. It's a cousin of hops, which is used, of course, to make beer. Um, the, um, the genus is cannabis and the subspecies are um, uh, sativa, indica, and ruderalis. Um, cannabis is an annual wind pollinated a plant. Um, it's um, dioecious, meaning that the male and female plants grow separately and it is assumed to have been to have evolved uh, from Central Asia in the regions of Mongolia in the regions of Mongolia and southern Siberia. And it, they found some 12,000-year-old fossils suggesting that it was one of, it was probably the first cultivated crop by humans, which is really anthropologically quite significant. Cannabis is um, um, the, I'm sorry, but the, the subspecies of cannabis um, have to do with the morphology of the plant, what the plant look like, and not the physiological effects that they impart. So sativas are tall plants with long, thin leaves. They are typically grown in northern climates, and indicas, like India, are short, bushy plants that are in, grown in the more southern climates, and they have broad leaves with wide fingers. These, the way the plant looks has nothing to do with the composition of the plant or the biological effects, much um, to the chagrin of the uh, cannabis industry that continues to label these plants as sativas being activating and indicas being good for sleep. There's no science behind that. They're all, everything that's in this country now, after years and years of unregulated crossbreeding, they're all hybrids. So those terms are just used um, for marketing. Um, hemp is a lay term arbitrarily defining a cannabis plant that has less than 0.3% THC. And marijuana, as, we, as I said before, an Aztec word for tobacco, um, is uh, used to, um, to uh, refer to plants that contain greater than 0.3% THC. And there are varieties of these sativa and ruderalis plants that are more fibrous and are typically grown for making rope, clothing, and canvas, among other things. Now bricks for houses. Um, and in, in, in probably up until probably about seven or eight years ago, those plants were really the higher source of CBD. But these days, the subspecies typically used for producing THC are now also bred for growing CBD See, dominant plants. Daddy checking the fish. Uh, mommy. Go check. Yes. So, so, um, and the reason that this is um, somewhat important is because of the terpene profiles that that interact with the cannabinoids. So that the more fibrous ruderalis and those plants that were used to make hemp and I mean to make ropes and canvas typically had poor terpene profiles, and is, there's a lot more to this plant than, um, than, have, than just um, uh, the cannabinoids. Okay. okay. So um, there are over 120 molecules that are particular to the cannabis plant, but I'm just going to focus now on on the ones that we know most about and that the ones that patients would be most likely to ask about. Um, some of them, are, um, they're ahead of the science and there's um, some of these cannabinoids are talked about a lot online and they're highly popular and people may ask you about them. So this is just a schematic of how the plant um, grows these or makes these cannabinoids. So cannabinoids that are shown in green um, are the acidic forms 
um, particularly CBD and CBDA. They occur only naturally in the can. They occur naturally only in the plant, and they're produced by enzymatic action uh, from cannabigerolic acid or CBGA. I don't know if you can see my pointer. But CBGA is kind of the mother stem cell of all the cannabinoids. And by different enzymatic pathways, they produce all of these acidic forms. So these forms um, that are acids have a carboxyl group on them that actually makes them more um, hydrophilic because these neutrals, as they um, are um, become CBD and THC and CBDV, um, these are decarboxylated and um, are highly lipophilic, and they're decarboxylated um, by heat and time. And generally, it takes a lot of heat and quite a bit of time um, to decarboxylate these um, acids. And for a long time, the acids were, um, if you went to a dis if dispensary, a patient would be told, oh, well, you have to heat it to activate it. Well, that couldn't be further from the truth because I'm going to tell you about these acidic forms of cannabinoids and their medical benefits. The, um, so the, the red ones, the CBD, the Delta-9, THC, CBDV, THCV, those are all um, degradation products of the acidic cannabinoids. And then in purple, you have the metabolic um, byproducts of THC, Delta-9 THC. And that would be Delta-8 THC, which is produced in very small quantities in the plant, and CBN, or um, cannabinol, um, which is marketed as a, a sedating cannabinoid. The science isn't quite there, but um, oftentimes um, patients will say, well, I'm using CBN to help with my sleep. All of these cannabinoids have some medical, medically beneficial effect. Um, we don't understand them all, but um, so far, everyone that we've looked at um, has been helpful in some way. So CBG, the, the mother cannabinoid, after it's been decarboxylated from CBGA as an alpha-2 adrenal receptor agonist, and it modulates GABA and glutamate. And these are commonly used in, med this is commonly used in medications um, uh, for um, treating patients with hyperactivity and irritability and aggressive behavior, much like clonidine and guanfacine, which are also used sometimes off-label for treating these, um, these symptoms. It is um, an uh, anti-inflammatory. It has been found to reduce pro-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-1 beta, uh, tumor necrotic factor alpha, and interferon gamma, and it enhances the anti-inflammatory effect of CBD. So CBD combined with THC, I'm sorry, CBD combined with CBG can be a really effective anti-inflammatory. Um, it is a 5-HT1A receptor antagonist. Um, another real helpful um, uh, thing about CBG is that it inhibits bladder contraction. So when it's combined with CBD or THC for patients who have um, um, bladder spasticity or um, interstitial cystitis and, are, um, and their sleep is erupted, erupted, interrupted quite a bit or they're having to make frequent trips to the bathroom, CBG may be helpful. Um, it too is an antioxidant, neuroprotective, um, and one thing to keep in mind that it does tend to reverse the antiemetic effects of CBD. Um, but its analgesic activity is actually pretty remarkable, and it is, um, um, at least in animal studies, it looks to be that it has greater analgesic activity than even THC. So um, I have found it to be very helpful for treating neuropathic pain when um, combined with CBD. CBDA, which is one of the acidics that's in the unheated plant, it's a COX-2 inhibitor. It also inhibits the release of interleukin-2 and interferon gamma, and it enhances PPAR gamma affinity um, to CBD. Um, PPAR gamma is actually um, helpful in reducing infl infl inflammation and in itching. It is um, analgesic uh, by interacting with TERP channels, ion channels. It, ha it does have anticonvulsant activity. 
it tends to be alerting and it has an anti-emetic benefit. It actually, um, studies look at um, motion sickness, it seems to be more effective than even CBD. It's also anxiolytic, it has some antidepressive benefit. All of these cannabinoids have some anti-tumor activity. We don't, at least I don't, um, promote cannabis as a treatment for, can for cancer, particularly for um, uh, a curable cancer by conventional methods but it certainly can be um, something that patients who are prone to cancer um, or who have a cancer that is not responding to conventional therapy, kind of, it, it's combining these um, cannabinoids may sometimes be helpful as sort of a Hail Mary, um, but I, I discourage patients from uh, relying on cannabis as a cancer treatment. There may be some benefit, but you shouldn't rely on it. Um, but CBDA has been found to show anti-tumor activity in triple negative breast cancer cells and to a lesser extent in um, prostate cancer and in ALL. But again, most of these studies, actually all these studies are either um, uh, uh, in vitro or in animal studies. And as we know, not everything that happens in the animal will happen in the humans. CBD is, um, you know, all over the place. It's an allosteric modulator at the CB1 receptor and mitigates the impairing effect of THC, whereas CBG does not have that effect. So for patients who wish to use THC for pain relief or mood elevation but don't want to feel high or impaired, they can, they can get the benefit of THC without all that if it's combined with CBD. And um, it theoretically increases anandamide levels by interfering with the hydrolysis of anandamide by Fa, and it is a PPAR gamma and terp channel agonist at uh oh, I'm making marks at agonist at the um, V1 and A1. I'm not sure where all those marks are coming from. <laughs> Something has taken over the slides, um, <clears throat> and it antagonize and it's an antagonist of the terp um, M8. I don't know what's going on. Okay, um, all right, it, hit, it also inhibits um, the release of tumor necrotic factor alpha and interferon gamma and increases the release of anti-inflammatory anti cytokines, interleukin-10 and interleukin-35. Okay, I'm gonna have to speed up. I don't know where these lines came from but I'm running out of time and I'm only halfway through. CBDV, CBDV you'll start hearing about, especially if you're a pediatrician. Um, it targets subcortical excitatory glutamate systems in both autistic and neurotypical adults. It modulates um, glutamate GABA uh, systems in the basal ganglia. And um, it, it appears that the individual responses are looking at MRIs. This is a study done by Perchi in 2019, depends on the baseline glutamate um, uh, glutamine levels. Um, there was a trial that was getting started with, at NYU by Hollander, who was one of the um, investigators for Epidiolex, looking at CBDV in treating irritability in, autis in children with, uh, and adults up to, I guess, up, no, it was five, ages 5 to 18 um, uh, for autistic patients, but it was canceled um, due to um, poor patient recruitment during COVID. So THCA is one of the other acids in the unheated plant. It's an orthosteric and allosteric modulator at the CB1 receptor. It's a good analgesic. It has good anti-inflammatory benefits. It also is anticonvulsant and is used sometimes as a second line after CBD for seizure disorders that don't respond to CBD. It's non-impairing. Um, Delta-9 THC is a partial agonist at the CB1 receptor. Uh, of course, we know that it is antispasmodic. It helps with tremors and, and pain. THCV is something else that patients may ask about. It's an appetite suppressant. I don't believe that it's any better appetite suppressant than CBD, but um, it's getting a little buzz. It also modulates glucose metabolism, as does CBD. So a lot of times these patients will, will find that they're, um, they get better blood sugar control. Sometimes we'll have to decrease insulin um, doses and certainly oral hypoglycemic doses and it's THCV is mildly impairing but not as much as THC 
THCA we've talked about, but this is a, a, just a recent study out of Spain looking at THCA, and they found that it reduced um, arthritis in collagen-induced arthritic mice, and it prevented infiltration of inflammatory cells, synovium, hyperplasia, and cartilage damage. Um, and it also inhibited the expression of inflammatory and catabolic genes in knee joints. So that's a kind of exciting for um, autoimmune illnesses, particularly rheumatic fever. I mean, rheumatic um, um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. THCA, a word of warning, is, is less euphoric than Delta 9 and is produced naturally in very small amounts in the plant. Um, but the 2018 Farm Bill had a loophole, and now Delta 8 has flooded the hemp market. Um, it's produced by converting CBD to Delta, 9, Delta 8 by using acids. So these Delta 8 products are not, um, it's not T Delta 8 THC that's produced naturally. These are um, produced by a chemical reaction. Um, it's a highly unregulated market. Many of these products are tainted with things like sulfuric acid. Um, and gas chromatography has shown many unidentifiable, in, unidentifiable chemical peaks that we have no idea what they are or what the effects they have. And so we strongly discourage patients um, um, and friends from buying these Delta 8 THC products. So if you're a Delta 8 producer out there, I apologize, but that's what it is. So as I said before, terpenes and flavonoids greatly influence how this plant works. Um, I'm, uh, for time's sake, I'm just gonna say that, um, that the um, terpenes definitely influence, the flavonoids influence how these um, cannabinoids work. And that's probably why a pharmaceutical cannabinoid will probably never be quite the same as getting it from the plant, let's say a botanical um, product. And this was first um, illuminated in 1998 by Mashulam and Ben Shabbat, who stated that the, they, were, they had an entourage effect. When I'm um, uh, thinking about ratios for patients, I look at um, impairment and what I'm treating. And so ratios were, are CBD, um, CBD dominant up to about five to one, tend to be non-impairing, and they're very good for treating anxiety, seizures, pain, great for starting elderly patients on CBD, CBG, and a one-to-one -one is a really good anti-inflammatory, also seems to be um, highly effective in reducing neuroexcitability um, and also in helping neuropathic pain. CBD with CBDA, because these acids are high, more hydrophilic, not like the neutrals, which are lipophilic, the acids are more readily absorbed from the GI tract, and so we tend to see efficacy at a much lower dose with the acids than we do with the neutrals. As we get into pain and depression, sometimes we need to go up on, these, um, on the THC component and so that should, is typically something that's done kind of gradually and as needed until you get a good therapeutic response. And then THC dominant products tend to be impaired. Well, they are impairing for most people unless they've developed, the patient has developed tolerance, but these um, can sometimes be necessary for um, pain syndromes and it definitely seems to be necessary for treating tics and tremor. So for patients, with Parkinson's, we generally see an improvement in tremors with um, THC, but not with the other necessarily with the other cannabinoids. And it can also be very helpful with um, um, treating PTSD. It has a fear extinction benefit that um, that some of the other cannabinoids don't seem to have, and it also has a pain distracting benefit, so that even if you can't get up under the pain completely, the patient will report, oh, "Well." It doesn't. It doesn't completely get rid of my pain, but when I use the THC, it just doesn't. The pain doesn't bother me. I just don't really care. So, and that that can be beneficial for patients with really severe and chronic pain. I wish I knew how to get rid of these red lines, but this is looking at the biphasic effect of cannabis. Um, and due to the biphasic effect, oh, whoever did that, thank you. Um, due to the biphasic effects. Um, patients need to be educated on how to titrate their doses. And this is done by starting with a very low dose 
and gradually increasing the dose until they get a therapeutic response. I'm almost afraid to use my little arrow, but um, so looking at this, as you go up on the dose, you get closer to efficacy, no pain, no anxiety, no seizures, no muscle spasm. But if you keep increasing the dose, if you're higher than the optimal dose, you actually get a downward turn. Um, and so you're gonna have less efficacy and decreased efficacy and the patient's gonna be paying a lot more for their medicine that they don't need. And if you get too high of a dose, then you get the symptom almost that you were trying to treat. Hence, THC at low doses is anxiolytic. At high doses, it can precipitate anxiety and paranoia. So it's, it's important to start with low doses and gradually increase. And this is a very individual thing in dosing because the endocannabinoid system's receptors have a lot of a SNPs and there are patients who will respond to one or two milligrams of a cannabinoid and others who need 800 milligrams. And there's no way to base the dosing on age, size, weight. It makes, you know, it, 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 it turns everything around what you do with pharmaceuticals. So the different modes of delivery, um, inhalation and intranasal, which is a vastly underutilized um, delivery system, um, is just like giving cannabis IV. It gets in there in 15 minutes or so, it starts working, um, it maxes out at between 15 and 30 minutes and the duration is about two to three hours. This is a great way to introduce um, THC to someone with Parkinson's because they just want to be able to shave or you know, eat or do things with their hands that they can't do when they have a tremor, but they don't necessarily want THC on board all day. Um, oral mucosal is um, a great way to follow intra, um, intranasal or an inhalation if it's used, let's say for a tremor or for um, or more, more importantly, like for, for severe pain or a panic attack where inhalation is, is very helpful, it doesn't last long. So for patients in severe pain, you can start with inhalation and then have them follow with oral mucosal. And it comes in tinctures, oils, um, gummies, or sublingual tablets. The onset of action is a little bit long, it's longer than with inhalation, but look at the duration. It, it lasts five to eight hours, so patients can often medicate you know, two or three times a day and stay um, in pain relief. Um, orals um, are a little bit trickier. They come in capsules, they come in edibles. I look at food, candy, and beverages as being more for a recreational or adult use market. I don't um, think that they're very helpful for many of these chronic conditions in that most of them have a lot of sugar and additives and emulsifiers, all of which disrupt the microbiome and increase inflammation. So. Capsules, because cannabis, at least the neutrals, are so poorly absorbed, um, I tend to reserve for gastrointestinal conditions. So uh, a patient with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis is more than likely going to be on capsules. Because these can neutral cannabinoids are so poorly absorbed, the, bo the s body will actually absorb as little as 6% of that dose. So that means the dose is in the gut where it needs to be, and it can be quite help they can be quite helpful for those patients and it has a good duration of action up to 12 hours. And um, paying attention to the duration of action or actually no, this, the onset of action. So the maximum um, uh, uh, plasma, uh, peak plasma uh, concentration, 15 to 30 minutes, that's the time that you need for patients to wait before they increase their dose. So if they're using inhalation, you take a puff or two, but then you wait let's say 10, 15, 20 minutes um, before you take another puff so that you don't overshoot. Same with oral mucosal, you wait 20 or 30 minutes before titrating, going up on the dose. Oral is a little bit harder to titrate. I generally tell them to titrate day by day. Topicals can be very helpful. They don't get into the bloodstream. They activate local receptors in the upper layers of the, of the epidermis. They come in balms and salves and creams. Onset of action is really pretty fast. Um, and they um, last a long time, five to eight hours. But like, just like the other forms, patients should apply those in thin layers and add on, add on, add on thin layers about every five minutes or so until the pain goes away. And they're very helpful for joint pain. So knees or even low back pain in thin patients where there's not much distance between the, um, the, the uh, pain and the skin. 
um, topicals can be helpful. The transdermals, um, they're difficult to titrate, except that you can just start by cutting transdermals and using a patch. There are some transdermal creams available, at least in the DC market. Onset of action is also very fast, about five minutes, um, due to that um, activating those local receptors in addition to driving those cannabinoids into the bloodstream. Duration of action can be 24 to 36 hours. Very helpful for chronic low back pain, for even um, diabetic uh, neuropathy, and the ex you know especially in the lower extremities, and for those um, autistic patients and those with neuroexcitability that have a lot of anger and irritability. So those are some other ways to use cannabis. Um, this slide is Dr. Really Fry. Mm -hmm. Dr. Fry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, you were concerned about time. We've got yes. plenty of. We don't we want to make sure that you're you're comfortable with. Do, you just keep going and do your presentation the oh. way you want. Okay? Oh, okay. Thank you. I, I saw that I was getting way over. So thanks. So um, this is um, a terrible slide to try to read. Um, it's way too small. But this is looking at um, some of the observational studies, clinical trials, and case series conducted on the use of cannabis in treating fibromyalgia, which is really one of those problem conditions, really hard to, to get patients comfortable. And they, um, some of these studies are pretty small. Um, some are, are not bad in terms of um, numbers, but I'll just kind of go through them one by one. Um, in that first study, it was, the um, number was 31. It was an observational crossover study that showed significant improvement in back pain that was maintained at six months. Um, the second study number was 20. It was a, um, what was it? It was a randomized placebo-controlled crossover study. Uh, it showed small analgesic response after a single in inhalation of um, cannabis, probably THC. Second study, number was 367. This was a prospective observational study showing a statistically significant reduction in pain intensity scales from nine out of 10 down to five out of 10 in 81% of the patients, um, which is typically what you'll see in practice, that you can often get that pain level cut in half at least. And um, there were relatively innocuous um, adverse effects, merely being dizziness, dry mouth, and some GI symptoms, which they didn't elaborate, but I suspect was maybe some diarrhea. Um, and this fourth study uh, was 102 subjects, and it was a prospective observational study. 59% showed moderate improvement in anxiety and depression scales. Again, anxiety and depression are so important to treat when we're treating chronic pain. Um, the next study, this, the number was 17. This was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled um, trial, and it showed um, statistically significant improvement in pain severity within one month, and this was maintained over a 12-month period. Also, that's very important. And the seventh study, there was the last one were 38 subjects. It was a retrospective open label statistic, um, trial. And it um, shows some statistically significant improvement in pain severity and a decreased impact on um, ability to function. So it actually, the, the disability aspect of, these, um, of this chronic pain and sleeplessness and um, anxiety and depression um, improved. And let's see. So this is a chronic pain patient list. This actually came from a patient that I saw, and this is not atypical. And as patients age, their medication list tends to grow longer and longer and longer, which increases the risk of at least some sort of drug-to-drug -drug interaction. So um, this patient had a four-year history of chronic pain and um, pain management. And after 18 months of using cannabis, this is what his um, medication list looked like. <clears throat> he was no longer on ibuprofen, he was no longer on gabapentin for neuropathy, alprazolam was gone, oxycodone was, that was his main pain treatment. The methadone was for breakthrough pain. He was on cyclobenzaprine for spasticity, and um, oh, the acetaminophen, 
Um, in between the ibuprofen, he was on mirtazapine, trazodone for sleep, and Ducalax because he was constipated from all the, the opioids. And the last time I saw him, um, he was on cannabis and uh, peridium. He, this was a, a patient with a neurogenic bladder uh, from a spinal cord injury um, who was pretty miserable uh, with four years of um, this these type of medications and has been doing much better and on um, just on the peridium and the cannabis. Um, this is a patient who came to the office. He had lost his insurance and he had been well managed on Humira and steroid topicals for many years. He came in with this exacerbation of his psoriasis vulgaris and also he, with um, joint swelling, joint pain. So um, he didn't have insurance to continue with his medications. So I started him on a CBD, CBDA um, oil, which he took oral mucosally drops under the tongue to get some activation of those local receptors in the um, mucosa, probably terp channels, although there's probably, there, there's, it's, it's kind of, it's been debated, debated on whether those cannabinoids go directly into the bloodstream through the capillaries, but definitely putting under the tongue really seems to help um, speed up the onset of action. Put him on a topical CBD salve, and four weeks later he came back in, and I think you can see the difference in, you know, he still has some post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, but the, the angry red psoriatic plaques have definitely improved, more so on the legs and in the arms, but also his joint pain uh, was gone, and so he was feeling much better. So these can be quite effective. Most of the adverse effects of cannabis are dose-related. There can be some drug-to-drug -drug interactions, typically with CBD. CBD hogs up all of the 3A4, cytochrome P450, 3A4, so it doesn't leave much for anybody else. So, but it doesn't seem to be a problem with doses under 30 milligrams. So if a patient is on medications where there's a, a more a narrow um, uh, therapeutic window, like statins, warfarin, tricyclic antidepressants, uh, MAOs, benzodiazepines, tamoxifen, all that, tamoxifen is, is a little bit different because that's a pro-drug, but the fact is that um, if all that CA4 is used up, then these other drugs won't be metabolized as we anticipate and we can get into toxicity. With tamoxifen being a pro-drug, we don't want to interfere with the metabolism because it's a metabolite that's active, so we have to be careful with that. I generally recommend patients who are taking CBD with anything, for any reason, at any dose, to take the CBD an hour or two after their medication, so not to mix it in with their morning meds or their evening meds, and that way we can avoid any potential um, problems. THC uses 3A4 to a certain extent in C9. There's some medications. It doesn't seem to be as a big a problem as CBD, um, and CBD doesn't seem to be as big a problem as we would think. Um, but when patients are on antifungals like metronidazole or um, those, those medications actually can increase THC concentrations by interfering with THC's metabolism. So especially with elderly patients, you have to be careful with those and definitely start off with very low doses of THC or patients who have been taking THC to tell them to cut back on their dose because if they're on these medications, they could have an effect that they're not anticipating. We see relatively few complications with cardiovascular disease, um, but for new users of THC, it can decrease blood pressure, it can increase heart rate. Um, those effects don't tend to be sustained over time, but for a patient with unstable angina, with, uh, um, with significant um, uh, coronary artery disease, who have never used cannabis, um, you have to be very, very careful with THC. And this is the, um, and I, w I just wanted to talk about an incident that happened that, that why I, I really feel that um, it's really important for us as physicians to kind of take back medical care from the dispensaries. I saw a lady who was 83 years old um, with chronic pain, but she was on nitroglycerin. Um, she, she 
couldn't go up the steps without getting short of breath. She went to a dispensary. She was given a card, um, and it the dispensary um, attendant, um, not being medically trained, sold her um, THC transdermal patches, a vape pen that was 90% THC and some other THC and when she showed me the bag and thank God she she um, brought you know brought me she said oh, I'm not sure about this I was like oh well you can't use this you can't use that you can't use that so she had a bag full of things that really could have put her at risk so um, so it's important for us as as healthcare providers to if we're going to, if we're giving out um, recommendations to advise our patients on how to use cannabis. Um, in a safe way. CBD can decrease appetite, which is usually in, in this day and time of an added benefit. It can also, as I said, um, help with um, glucose and, um, and lipid metabolism. But for someone who's anorexic, for someone who's, who needs to gain weight, um, you have to be careful with THC and, um, of course, TH, uh, with CBD. THC and appetite stimulant can counter that um, dizziness poor coordination, reaction time, or potential problems, especially for the elderly. We have to be careful with THC. Um, I generally recommend starting doses very small and at night only at bedtime for several nights and let their system kind of get accustomed to THC before even thinking about giving them a daytime dose. And, it, and if it's anyone other than a Parkinson's or patient or a Tourette's patient, I almost always combine CBD with THC to prevent these, these problems. Um, THC dependence is generally not seen in medical use. It's related to high THC use, generally in the adult use market, um, almost always associated with excessive inhalation or using mechanisms like dabbing to get these huge doses. Um, just don't see it in the medical use of cannabis, even with patients who are using THC dominant products. Um, sedation can occur with CBD or THC, and of course, we all know that THC can precipitate anxiety and paranoia, especially in um, a patient who's not experienced with THC, but also we found in the Epidiolex studies that high doses of CBD can also precipitate anxiety. We found that in the autism patients. So all of these cannabinoids adhere to that biphasic effect. Um, THC can certainly uh, precipitate psychosis or hallucinations. I had a patient with dissociative event, um, but THC at low doses is actually an antipsychotic. So it's not contraindicated in patients with a history of psychosis or, um, you know, either from schizophrenia or bipolar disorder with psychotic features or schizoaffective disorder. I've a lot, seen a lot of patients, those patients are generally, or almost all, I'm going to say, they're referred. Um, I, I don't treat patients with these kind of conditions unless they're being followed by a mental health provider and referred to me. So you just have to be careful with THC because they can precipitate those events. Um, seizures, again, THC at low doses has a, a, a fairly decent anticonvulsant um, benefit, but at high doses it can lower the seizure threshold. And CBD, again, found in the Epidiolex studies where these kids were using eight, 9,000 milligrams of CBD, that it, it can um, stimulate diarrhea. So I talked a, almost, or talked a little bit already about this, about the cytochrome P450. Um, this can be circumvented through, um, by using cannabis um, intranasally or um, um, by inhalation. And, and, and in modes of delivery, I failed to mention um, the use of either vaginal or rectal suppositories. And um, these can be very helpful rectal suppositories for patients with, um, with uh, anal fissures or painful anal fissures with um, perianal disease, with prostate hypertrophy, with um, um, a number of, of pelvic issues. Uh, THC can be used to, um, to alleviate those symptoms. Um, it is thought that the reason, there's a lot of debate on whether THC is absorbed through the rectum. 
Um, it, prob it is it, it probably at very small doses, and that's why a lot of people who use rectal suppositories don't feel the euphoric effect of THC, but, in, um, but CBD is absorbed through the rectum, and both cannabinoids are absorbed through the vag vaginal mucosa. So, um, so the doses of suppositories on the market tend to be rather high. I see 50 milligrams, 60 milligrams. If those suppositories are used vaginally, um, it's probably gonna be way too much. It may be just enough for rectal um, absorption. And um, it's also thought that the THC bypasses the portal vein through rectal um, uh, it, uh, absorption and therefore would bypass this issue in the liver with um, cytochrome P450. So just, just to know that. So with all of these medications and probably more, um, with high dose CBD, you may get some um, some drug to drug interaction, meaning that you're gonna um, impede metabolism. So I, I recommend with any of these medications to have the patient space their doses one to two hours um, actually after, I mean, yeah, to, to take their medication first and then wait an hour or two before um, using CBD. So, um, so what is the other problem? Well, cannabis use disorder, um, that can be an issue. Um, the, the addiction rate or dependence rate for, for cannabis is about 9%. That's up a little from 6%. Um, and probably due to what I was talking about with these very highly concentrated THC products, a dabbing, um, it, but this does not happen with medical patients. The at-risk group um, demographic are males 18 to 24. Um, they're usually very, um, they're heavily, um, they're using very heavy doses, high doses, um, using cannabis throughout the day, um, smoking and dabbing. Um, and it can be a problem. And, but when we look at the other substances that these uh, patients could be using, alcohol, heroin, nicotine, cocaine, except for caffeine, all of the other um, substances can pretty much kill them. Uh, cannabis with its high LD50, um, it's not likely that anybody's going to smoke themselves to death using cannabis, um, and hopefully they'll outgrow this and have a chance to kind of get things together. But um, so some people look at cannabis as even though it may be a problem for some, there may be a harm reduction element to this. Um, in any patient who's using cannabis before the age of 14, I consider that a soft sign of an underlying mental health issue Oftentimes it's anxiety, it could be social anxiety, it could be anxiety disorder, it could be depression, it could be PTSD. And um, the place to look first is at the family um, and looking for family dysfunction, for uh, violence, emotional abuse, these types of things that go on in the home often drive young people to, um, to chill out with cannabis. And so um, we can't get up, uh, we can't offer them uh, we have to be able to offer them an alternative to cannabis and, and it first um, demands that we recognize the problem and then seek um, or guide that patient into um, more acceptable um, therapy and maybe some pharmaceutical therapy so that they're not using cannabis on their own. Um, I love this picture. And this was my patient and she had a glioma. She, she did succumb to the glioma, but she was having tremendous headaches and she found relief with using cannabis oil. And this is a picture of her grandson helping her with her medicine. And they sent me this and every time I look at it, I, I, I kind of tear up a little bit, but um, this is our growing demographic. This is the, the these are, the, these, geriatric patients are turning to cannabis for symptom relief and so we have to be cognizant of some of their special issues but i'll start with pediatrics um, so pediatric use and medical use in teens and in children tend to um, be either for autism and as generally with ear, um, these patients the parents are going to bring them in they're, they're highly irritable they're 
hitting mom, they're punching holes in the wall, they're aggressive at school, the family is um, just in a mess, and um, they, they're desperate for help. They, the atypical antipsychotics, as I said, are of marginal efficacy, um, and there hasn't been m much improvement in symptoms using um, SSRIs or uh, antihypertensives, a lot of things that are used off-label. Actually, for autism, for core symptoms of autism, there is no FDA-approved pharmaceutical for the treatment of core symptoms of autism, which are repetitive um, behaviors, um, impaired expressive language, and impaired social interactions. Um, the FDA has approved melatonin for their sleep disorders, um, methylphenidate, uh, for their ADHD, a lot of those kids have ADHD, and then the atypical antipsychotics, um, Abilify and um, Risperdal for irritability, but they, they don't work very well, and we see a lot of problems with them, and parents don't like it. So they're going, they may come to you looking for cannabis, but there are groups and groups all over the internet, Facebook, this one, that one, of parents treating other parents, other kids, and you know, other parents' children. And that's because we as healthcare providers um, are not taking our heads out of the sand and realizing that these patients are going to move forward whether we participate or not. And a lot of them are getting really bad advice. And so, um, so just be aware um, that, that cannabis can be used very effectively and safely in children with autism. Um, I've treated patients, especially with things like um, connective tissue disorders like Ehlers-Danlos, uh, complex regional pain syndrome, which is a terribly difficult condition to treat. And cannabis doesn't really take care of it all, but it definitely can help. Um, there's some mitochondrial disorders that respond particularly to CBDA, um, for some reason, and of course, we've used cannabis uh, for palliative care in patients, in pediatric patients um, with cancer when they're at end of life. Um, we know a lot about epilepsy. The use of, for epilepsy, I've talked about inflammatory bowel disease. Um, THC is actually better tolerated in children than adults. I'm much less concerned about a four-year-old than I am an 84-year-old um, with THC. You say, well, why would a four-year-old be using THC? Well, a four-year-old with a medulloblastoma or a, um, you know, a, 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 another treatment-resistant cancer that we're, you know, it's kind of like, okay, that Hail Mary, let's see if we can help. These kids can tolerate two, three, four hundred milligrams of THC, usually given with CBD to help um, mitigate some of the impairment, but they do much better um, and I'm not as concerned about a four-year-old as I am with an 84-year-old. So in geriatrics, which is the largest growing demographic, um, they tend to be more sensitive to THC, especially females. Females seem to um, develop more um, CB1 receptors, probably in a response to um, the downregulation of a lot of other systems. The endocannabinoid system tries to upregulate, so you have to be very careful with THC doses and again, start them at bedtime, increase them gradually. And um, I almost always use uh, THC with CBD in the geriatric population, unless they have a condition that really um, only responds to THC. Um, and that would be Parkinson's or maybe a Tourette's or a tick. Um, pregnancy and breastfeeding, the, it's very controversial. There are studies that say, oh, it doesn't do anything. There are studies that say, oh yeah, it does, uh, in terms of um, detri being detrimental to the fetus. Um, there's a, there was a fairly recent Canadian study looking at the, um, the incidence of autism in, it, it was a, there were a lot of issues with the study, but still it was something that can't be ignored that um, increased incidence of autism in cannabis users versus non-users. But again, there were a lot of um, elements to that study that really need to be tightened up before we can say that, that cannabis increases the incidence of autism. But again, it's also something that cannot absolutely cannot be ignored. But um, it is a good antiemetic, and there's some um, 
patients who have uh, a terrible time with uh, nausea and vomiting. And for hyperemesis gra gravidarum, in patients who have failed conventional therapy, um, and generally is Zofran, um, sometimes using cannabis in small doses can be just enough, um, not in mega doses, but just enough to allow that patient to eat and also um, allow the patient to stay at home. So, uh, you know, like a, a mother with three children, when it, it's, you know, like, do you go in the hospital or can she stay home and get this under control with cannabis? Um, it's, it's worth considering. Um, also for postpartum depression, for patients who haven't responded to conventional therapy, um, who have postpartum depression and maybe breastfeeding, um, we, have to, we have to look at, like anything in medicine, benefit versus risk. And so for pregnant and breastfeeding mothers, I recommend clean water, fresh air, and nutritious food and nothing else. And if the benefit of cannabis outweighs any potential risk, um, I'm not totally adverse to it. But um, th these are, these are the, the populations that you have to really kind of think about what you're doing and use cannabis in a way that's gonna maximize the benefit and, and minimize any adverse effects. So, other, let me see, here we go with conditions or use with caution. Contraindications are used. I used to label this contraindications. Now I kind of say, well, use, use with caution. Um, of course, THC and CBD, any of the cannabinoids in pregnancy in patients who are planning on becoming pregnant or who are breastfeeding, um, I like to have a very clear picture that the benefit is going to outweigh risk. Uh, for THC only, you have to be very careful with patients with a history of psychosis or who have a strong family history of psychosis. For um, patients with a baseline systolic of less than 100, those are usually very small um, elderly women um, who can get dizzy and fall, so you have to be careful. Um, any type of marked cardiovascular instability, uh, especially with new use. I, I, I once saw a patient, a California patient who had been smoking THC probably since Vietnam War and had the most hideous cardio, megaly, congestive heart failure, ejection fraction, I don't remember, but I was, I was it, there's no way I would have recommended um, that he use THC except for the fact that he'd been using it all along and he was fine. So um, just be careful. Um, and especially in, in geriatric and cannabis naive patients. Um, CBD only, um, patients with anorexia, depression, you have to be careful. Glaucoma, CBD, I think I failed to mention this, can increase intraocular pressure. But CBG has been found in animal studies to decrease animal um, decrease intraocular pressure, so that would be a better choice for someone with glaucoma. And as, we, as I said, CBG is a really good anti-inflammatory and analgesic. So glaucoma patients, I kind of discourage using CBD. I also forgot to mention that CBD tends to relax the gastroesophageal sphincter. While it's anti-inflammatory and a lot of the symptoms of GERD are due to inflammation, um, it also um, um, modulates um, gastric acidity by CB2 activation that the, um, you have to be careful because that gastroesophageal, uh, gastroesophageal sphincter tone, if it is too relaxed, um, it can exacerbate GERD symptoms. And I once saw um, a nonverbal child whose patients were, whose parents were um, dosing him with these high doses of CBD and he had GERD that was, he was a preemie and he had GERD from birth, from infancy. And they were saying, well, when he gets the CBD, he starts crying more, he's splashing around, slashing around. And, and, and my thought was that it's probably it was exacerbating his GERD symptoms. So be careful with that. Um, it's not to say that it can't be used, but watch the dosing and, and, and advise the patient that if they're ex in experiencing any increased symptoms, that it might be the CBD. Um, let's see. 
just a little tidbit on patients may ask you about this. These are all in vitro studies, but of course, you know, the, the internet lit up um, that, that cannabinoids treat COVID. Well, not necessarily. So there's a 2022 study looking at cannabigerolic acid or CBGA and cannabidiolic acid, CBDA. Um, and they found that these acidic cannabinoids prevented the, um, the, um, the, the affinity of the spike protein to infect human epithelial cells. But this was done in a pseudovirus that expressed the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So it wasn't even a real COVID virus, um, but, and it was done in a, in a Petri dish or a, a test tube. So, so patients may, you know, they don't talk about COVID so much anymore, but um, just to be aware. And that uh, another study, one was University of Oregon, I think the other was University of Chicago, saw that um, CBD and one of its metabolites, 7-hydroxy-CBD, blocked um, SARS-CoV-2 replication in lung epithelial cells. Um, again, this was a, uh, an in vitro study, and all of this doesn't necessarily translate to humans, but as of interest, they looked at um, the seizure patients, uh, and I, I don't remember the author, but um, in, comp in looking at um, COVID rates in pediatric seizure patients who were using Epidiolex, which is pretty high doses of CBD, versus those who were on conventional anticonvulsants, the, the um, prevalence of, or, of COVID infection in the Epidiolex um, population was significantly lower, but we don't know if, if that has to do with the pharmaceuticals they were taking, or they stayed at home more, or, or what, but it was just an interesting finding. So what are the requirements of bud tenders? All right, I got this off the internet. Bud tenders must be friendly with good customer service skills. They must have knowledge of marijuana strains. There are no strains in, in botanicals, they're varietals, but they must know the marijuana strains and products, good organizational skills, a clean criminal record, they must be trustworthy and reliable. Those are the requirements for the job. Bud tender responsibilities, greeting and welcoming customers, not patients, informing the manager of customer complaints and operational issues, sharing firsthand experiences of cannabis products to address customer concerns. Nowhere in there are they supposed to be treating patients and offering medical advice for treating medical conditions. That's our job. So we cannot give out cards and expect these patients to go to the dispensary and have the bud tender tell them what they need. All right. So it's down here as well. <laughs> that is. So anyway, I, uh, I would like to end this talk by reminding all of us physicians that cannabis can be a very useful addition to our treatment toolbox, that it can be used as a medicine and not necessarily as a recreational or adult use drug, and that I thank you for your attention and I encourage you to, if you want to take a deeper dive or more focused dive into the use of cannabis as medicine, to um, consider um, looking at the website for the Society of Cannabis Clinicians. It was established in 1999, started by Todd McCurria, a psychiatrist in California as a nonprofit for the sole purpose of educating physicians on the medical use of cannabis. And it, um, I invite you to visit the website to access our peer reviewed research papers and the educational modules that are geared towards practitioners. And I also ask that anybody who is interested in helping us to to manage this this medical cannabis um, um, environment in maryland to please consider joining our task force uh, for medical cannabis um, the industry is taking over this um, this medicine and 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 i hope that we as healthcare providers um, stand up for the patients and make sure that the ratios and products and THC concentrations that are 
beneficial for our patients are available through these dispensaries. And with that, I'm done. Thank you. Um, this is Barbara from MedKai. I just had um, wanted to say in the chat, I've given my email address. If anyone wants a copy of the recording, I've already received some emails, but just in case you didn't get a chance to see the chat, uh, my email is in there. Also in the chat is the link for you to click to get your CME as well. One thing I'd like to, um, if, am I still on? Um, just so that you know that, <laughs> that Maryland patients do have access to DC dispensaries and there's a difference between a DC dispensary and a DC pop-up store. Um, so if they ask about that, um, there's seven licensed dispensaries in the district that accept anybody's card, everybody across the world's card, and um, th that they should um, be careful um, with some of the unlicensed um, uh, stores that are in the district. Um, there are certain dispensaries that actually do have more, what I consider medical ratios, uh, more um, uh, CBD, THC flowers. That's one thing I didn't even talk about was having patients make tea. I'll have, we'll have to do it again sometime and talk specifically about about what patients can do um, when they can't find the acids in the dispensaries. They can make tea, which is very helpful for arthritic pain. But, um, you know, I, I can't make, um, I, what I can say is that there's one dispensary in the district that does have a lot more CBD with their THC than in Maryland. And if you go on the websites for the di various um, dispensaries, um, you'll see which one that is. And sometimes we have to send patients there because um, they can't find um, 10 to one or two to one or four to one in Maryland. Um, there, we did have those products, but unfortunately um, a lot of the growers aren't gr growing the plant, their processors are not making the medicine. And so um, sometimes patients do go to the district, which is technically against the rules, um, but that's where the medicine is sometimes. Um, let's see. I don't know what the qualifications for the dispensary clinical um, directors are. Um, I know that physicians, pharmacists, um, nurse practitioners, uh, one of the pharmacies, I know there's a nurse with a lot of um, cannabis um, experience who's the clinical director. I believe um, they have to have some kind of health care um, uh, qualification, uh, certification. Um, trying to see if there's any other question in here I can answer. I, I think I answered all the questions I see. If I missed one, I'm happy to answer questions. You can email me at pfry at tacomacare.com. So that's Tacoma, like Tacoma Park, T-A-K-O-M-A-C-A-R-E.com. It may be a couple of days before I get to respond, but if you have any questions um, that I, I didn't answer in the talk, um, feel free to email me. Um, and also, Frank, I'm not sure if you saw that we had a question in the chat about the CME and everyone might run into this as well. When when they're going to sign up on the date that they participated, it's only listing May the 24th. Yeah, that I, 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 I've noticed that and I'm going to go in and correct that. Um, please just use the form anyway. I, I will correct the date situation. Okay. Uh, it Thank was a mistake you. in the form, so I'm sorry if there's creating confusion, but the form is good. Uh, it's it's just something that that apparently a glitch in the system that we use for that evaluation form. But please don't hesitate to use the form. We can adjust everything. 